use the word good so easily, but think about what that means to each of us. There are some tremendous needs represented just in this congregation, but we also have the opportunity to represent needs all over the world. If you would like to come forward and pray on behalf of or because of somebody, please come now. This morning we'd like to remember Wendy, who will be undergoing some serious testing this week. If somebody would like to come specifically for Wendy, that would be great. And on behalf of the families that suffered loss and trauma yesterday in the shooting in Buffalo, we want to remember those. And for the war in Ukraine, for both of the Ukrainians and the Russians, and everybody else who's involved, we pray on behalf of them. And for whatever needs that you know that you'd like to bring before God, this is the perfect time to bow before God in your seats, in the sanctuary, and at home. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, here we are one more time, and we are thankful to be here. Thankful that we have the opportunity to purposely, intentionally come to gather with other believers, other people who love you, who are seeking to know more about you in your house of worship. And we thank you for this place. We thank you for the people. We thank you for your presence. God, we want to begin with thankful hearts. But we are also a needy people. We need you so desperately in our lives and for other people, for the things that are weighing our hearts so heavily this morning. Lord, Help us to allow you to invade them, to take charge, to take possession of the hurts and the challenges and the problems that we experience. Whether they're in the, our jobs, our places where we work, so many people have shared with me the difficulties that they have with coworkers and the situations. God, you know, show us how to be your hands and feet to show love to people who are unloving and unlovely so that we can show you to them. And God, we pray for Wendy this morning and for Chuck, for the challenges, the surgeries, the difficulties, the tests. We pray for complete healing. We know that healing is your plan. Healthy and wholesome lives are what you came for, what you desire for us. And so we earnestly plead on their behalf. And anybody else who's struggling with a physical ailment, a physical issue, Lord, for all of those on our prayer requests, uh, in our email, God, we pray for them, for their families. And Lord, for the, the wars and rumors of wars all over the world, we know that peace, the shalom that you inhabit was your plan for this world. And we pray for the people involved, that you would comfort, that you would show them the way, that you would protect and direct and reveal to them the way that they should behave and to take care of the people who are, who are trying to make a difference, who are trying to bring about that shalom. And God, we thank you for the city council, the housing and urban development council, that we, the decisions they made would be wise decisions to make a healthier community in Chandler. Because a healthy community helps everybody. And we know that this was your plan also. And thank you for allowing us to be just a little part of that. But God, right now, we pray that you would have it our worship, that you would hear our prayers, that you would speak to us and through us so that when we leave in just a little while, we would be changed because we have been in your presence. For all these things and so much more, we pray in your holy name. And all God's people said, Amen and Amen. Have you ever been criticized for doing something in a different way? <laughs> oh, I guess so. For breaking a tradition, for changing something? Does anybody want to share? Oh no. Uh -uh. Robin. Okay. I thought 
thought we should eat turkey first at Thanksgiving. But I was married into a very traditional Italian family, and they brought out the pasta first. <laughs> That's right. Pasta before turkey at Thanksgiving. And to me, it was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> What, what if you don't like turkey? My mother doesn't like turkey. She likes ham. All right, anybody else? <laughs> what if you don't eat meat? <laughs> traditions are good. We like traditions. Traditions make us comfortable. They give us a space that we're, we understand, that we can predict. We know what's going to happen. We love, I, traditions around Christmas, oh my goodness. We have some traditions here that I just love. But what if we changed them? What would happen? Our worship is filled with traditions and ways or methods that we're comfortable with doing in a particular way or that we even believe are the necessary ways to do things. Think about something that you would be very uncomfortable doing in a different way. I've asked you to do things that you don't like, and I hear about it. Like, turn to your neighbor. <laughs> yeah, right? Because I don't, I don't want this to be a 20-minute speech. I don't think that me standing up here talking to you is the very best way to increase our understanding of God's kingdom or to preach the gospel. I think you need to think about it, which is why I make you do those things. And, and I heard from you that you don't like it. So that's one thing that we've changed around here, right? What are some other things that you would be really, really unhappy or sad or uncomfortable if we had to change? We never sang our worship. If we never sing in worship, huh? But what if we change the songs? I don't mind. <laughs> you don't mind, but some people do. Yes. <laughs> I hear about that too. Go to Chuck. Right? Mm -hmm. All right. Let me ask you this. The things that you have to change, have you ever asked yourself if it's a moral issue? or a comfort issue. Hmm. I mean, is there anything intrinsically wrong with changing something? And how did you decide if it was a right or wrong issue or a comfort issue? Or how convenient or inconvenient it was. Let me give you some examples. What about, um, hmm, these are some real hot button issues. Baptism, communion, singing worship songs, that was on my list, uh, musical instruments, drones in the sanctuary? Ah. 30 years ago, that was a big deal. Now it's like, oh, okay, can we find somebody to play them? Right? Um, Bible translations. I know people who will only read the King James Version because that's the one that Peter used. <laughs> right? Um, child rearing. To spank or not to spank. That used to be an issue. Now it's like, no. Um, female pastors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a real big deal to some people. Maybe it is to you and you just put up with me. I don't know. Um, there's a quote that, that John Wesley used that we have frequently quoted. It's attributed to him, but it didn't begin with him. And it's, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In everything else, charity. Okay, in the things that you have that you can't do without, the things that are not optional, we have to get along with them, right? In things that are not essential, that are optional, allow people to be different. And in everything, 
put on the garment of love, the lenses of love. So back to that question, how do we decide which things that make us happy or comfortable that we practice are essential or not essential? How do we decide? Okay, I'm going to give you the easy answer. Ask God. I know, I know, right? Um, but here is some more useful, more helpful information. Um, John Wesley, and you know, I talk about him a lot. He's kind of like the father of Methodist. Well, he is the father of Methodist. Not kind of, he is. Uh, had what's called the Wesley Quadrilateral, which is a term he never used. But there were four things that John Wesley used to decide what was important and what he could allow uh, liberty for other people to practice. Okay, four things. Um, reason, tradition, experience, and scripture. It's called the quadrilateral because, you know, a square is a quadrilateral that has four equal angles. And I'm going to be very careful or else Chuck will correct me, Chuck the math teacher. Uh, a quadrilateral has four sides, but the angles are different angles. The angles are different. Uh, and scripture is the longest side because John Wesley used scripture to test everything else. And so, reason, tradition, experience, scripture. So you can ask yourself these four questions. Does this thing seem reasonable to you? Um, why or why not does it seem reasonable or not seem reasonable? Two, is this thing or practice that you do uh, a part of an important tradition? How did you begin this tradition? Is it right or wrong? How, where did it start? What's your reason for doing it? There's an old joke about a young wife who after they got married, started cutting off the end of her roast to put it in the roasting pan every Sunday. And her husband said, why do you do that? And she says, because my mother does, did that way. My mother taught me how to. And so one day she finally goes back and asks her mother, why, why do you cut the end off you? Because I had a small pan. <laughs> so you need to ask, your, I know it's a dumb joke, but you need, to, you need to ask yourself, why do we have this tradition? Is there a good reason for it? Or is it just a, a, a way we do things? that we like because it's comfortable because we've always done them that way. Find out the beginning, the, the or origins. Three, has this thing or this practice been beneficial or harmful to anybody? How did you learn about it? Was it a reliable resource where you found it? Okay, just because you read it on Facebook doesn't mean it's true. <laughs> Check it out. Go to the resources, go to the sources. Find out if it came from a reasonable place. And lastly, what does scripture say about this? You know, scripture doesn't talk about everything. You may have figured that out by now. You can't find everything in the Bible, but you definitely can find the guidelines for how to determine it. How to think about it. And I would add a number five to this list. And that, I guess, would make it a pentagon. And that would be the Holy Spirit. Allow the Holy Spirit to inhabit your discernment process, the way you think about it, the way you look at things. Um, and I'm sure that John Wesley included the Holy Spirit in all of this. I am certain he did. If we are living in close lockstep with God, the Holy Spirit is going to be on that journey, on every step of the journey with us. This morning, we are going to read part of our family story, in which Peter, who happens to be my favorite because he's a loud mouth, impulsive man, learns something mind-blowing from God the Holy Spirit and immediately faces some serious backlash from his homies. So please rise to honor the reading of God's Word from Acts chapter 11, verses 1 through 18. I will be reading from the easy reading version. The apostles and the believers in Judea heard that non-Jewish people had accepted God's teaching too. But when Peter came to Jerusalem, 
Some Jewish believers argued with him. They said, you went into the homes of people who are not Jews and are not circumcised, and you even ate with them. So Peter explained the whole story. He said, I was in the city of Joppa. While I was praying, I had a vision. I saw something coming down from heaven and looked like a big sheet being lowered to the ground by its four corners. It came down close to me, and I looked inside. I saw all kinds of animals, including wild ones, as well as reptiles and birds. I heard a voice say to me, Get up, Peter. Kill anything here and eat it. But I said, I can't do that, Lord. I've never eaten anything that is not pure or fit to be used for food. But the voice from heaven answered again, God has made these things pure. Don't say they are unfit to eat. This happened three times. Then the whole thing was taken back into heaven. Suddenly, there were three men standing outside the house where I was staying. They'd been sent from Caesarea to get me. The Spirit told me to go with them without wondering if it was all right. These six brothers here also went with me, and we went to the house of Cornelius. He told us about the angel he had seen standing in his house. The angel said, Send some men to Joppa to get Simon, the one who is also called Peter. He will speak to you, and what he tells you will save you and everyone living in your house. After I began speaking, the Holy Spirit came on them just as he came on us at the beginning. Then I remembered the words of the Lord Jesus. John baptized people in water, but you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. God gave these people the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. So how could I object to what God wanted to do? When the Jewish believers heard this, they stopped arguing. They praised God and said, So God is also allowing even those who are not Jews to change their hearts so that they can have the life he gives. This is the word of God for the people of God. And all God's people said, Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. You may be seated. You need to understand how ridiculously outrageous this was. It is revolutionary. It was mind-blowing. There's so much to talk about here. But never fear, I will focus. Dr. Luke records this story twice in the book of Acts of the Apostles. Once when it happened to Peter in chapter 10, and at the house, I love this part, of an unnamed man. We don't even know who this host was, but he had the place because he was a host, and he opened his home. He allowed this to happen there. And again, the second time, when Peter gets criticized for his actions, Something that we need to recognize in the story is how important this is. In the ancient world, there was limited space for writing. They didn't have computers or tablets or smartphones or even books. They didn't have paper. They had papyrus, which took a lot of time and effort to make. And a scroll of papyrus that is very longest was about 35 feet long. And I can't imagine having a book that you had to unroll to find a particular place in it. But, okay, so the reason that's important is uh, William Barclay says that the book of Acts would have taken up about 35 feet the way that Dr. Luke wrote it. So he had to actually think very carefully about what he was going to include in this scroll of papyrus. And he told this whole story twice. So you need to recognize this is really, really important for us to read and think about, okay? This story of Peter being criticized makes me think of so many arguments that I have read on social media. It's so easy to think you have the whole story and believe that person A is making a tragically immoral mistake. And so you self-righteously correct them. And then persons B through Z all jump into the argument and the conversation. And it just, it blows up. And feelings get hurt. Right? But what if you do not have the whole story? 
like these most likely kind-hearted believers, these people in Jerusalem, they heard what was going on over there and they thought they knew the whole story. They were ready to jump all over Peter and accuse him to, did you read that last phrase? Eating with uncircumcised men. Gasp. They broke, he broke the rules. Right? So what was the real problem with this event? These earnest people in Jerusalem believed that there were rules to follow. Pastor Andy alluded to that this morning with the kiddos. There were 613, to be precise. There's no way I would be able to remember all those. Probably not you either. Now, these rules have been handed down from generation to generation to generation. So there were more rules than, for them than they could remember also, but they were a way of life for them. This is how they have lived, how they have learned how to do everything. The only way of life that these people knew. They believed that you had to follow rules in order to worship God. One right way. So, how do we, how should we think about the ways that we do things? It requires some serious listening on our parts. Listening to the Holy Spirit. Look back at the scripture that we just read. How did Peter explain his outrageous actions to those people? What did he do? First, Peter had credibility. They knew who he was and they believed him. They knew that what he said had something to listen to. I mean, there, there was something to it, right? They knew that Peter knew God. Second, Peter explained what he understood had happened. He didn't argue. He just told them the facts. He said, this is what happened. That had happened three times. Third, look at verse 12. Peter took witnesses with him. How many? That makes, including Peter, seven witnesses to this event. Now, in both Egyptian law and Roman law, Seven witnesses meant it was case closed. Boom. Proof. That's it. He had proved his case by saying that there were that many people. Fourth, Peter quoted the Holy Spirit. He's quoted what Jesus had said. He used what we would call scripture. These shocked believers' reactions to Peter's testimony Show us how to handle disagreements with other Christians, with other people. Before judging others, before deciding we have the whole story, we need to listen to other people. We need to hear their story. The Holy Spirit might have something to teach us through them. Can I get an amen? Oh, no, 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 no. We might not have the whole story. Yeah. All righty then. So, back to our original question. How do we allow space for God to change us? I don't want to change. I talk to people every day who don't want to change the way they think. My husband was trying to change me this morning in the car on the way to church. And I said, you need to stop lecturing me. And he said, I'm not lecturing you. And I said, yes, you are. I did not want to hear what he had to say. <laughs> Even though he was right. <laughs> so, back to my question. How do we allow space for the Holy Spirit to just a little crack to just get in and, and say, hmm, you need to think about that. You need to stop. Stop, look, and listen. Did anybody ever hear, hear that in school? Stop, look, and listen. Yeah, okay. It's good for us, too. Um, to change our traditions, to change our spaces, and, and open them to possibilities to other people that we might not have welcomed before. 
our story is God's story, but we're not the ones writing it. We're not the ones writing the story. Change can be hard for us to understand and hard for us to actually implement. Change. Change is loss, even if it's a good change. And we need to acknowledge that it's difficult. It really is. These past two years have brought so many changes for us, right, that we never thought of before. We've experienced trauma and loss. And sometimes we just had to change the way we do things. In just a few moments when we celebrate the sacrament of communion, I will show you that there are options up here. We're going to do it one of the ways that we've done it in the past and another way that we've done it in the past. That was also a change. So we can change. It's just hard, right? God has been so faithful through these changes that we've experienced. So God has been there. There's been so much confusion and heartache, but God has been there. The future will bring more changes, more challenges. Trust me on this one. But God will be there in the future too. So the question for us this morning is, how does our journey reflect the influence of Christ. How are we allowing space? How are we stopping and slowing down and listening and allowing God to use our hands, to move our feet, to break our hearts for the things that God desires to see in us and around us? This is the question that we will each one have to answer throughout our lives and at the end of our lives. How have we reflected the glory of God when we go about our days? Let us pray. Gracious Father, we don't like to change, especially when it's not our own idea. And so we pray that as you inhabit everything else in our lives, you will inhabit the change and <clears throat> affirm within us that it's going to be good, whatever it is, because you are in it with us. And for all these things, we say thank you, and we say help. In your name we pray, amen. Today for the sending, consider child sponsorship and crisis care kits. We are down to the wire. This just a stone blade coming. And prepare to receive the benediction from 2 Corinthians chapter 13. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Leave to serve. Have a great Sunday.